Hi, and thanks for checking out this video. Today I want to share the results of building a Segway-like transporter. This first shot shows its key components. If you decide to do this too, I can tell you that all the parts are new and can be had through eBay or Amazon. The outer frame is 1 by 3 8020 aluminum. The wheels are 12 and a half inch e-scooter wheels and the motors are geared 24 volt 350 watt brushed motors and the tiller or steering column is a telescoping cane that I bought at our local Walmart. Since I have no welding skills and my ability to freehand drill a hole barely exceeds my hitting a target at 100 yards on a windy day with a BB gun, I chose 8020 and its companion hardware to build the frame. Also, since the scooter wheels have 10 millimeter axles, I went with an outrigger type frame as opposed to cantered levered wheels set up. So while this entry won't earn any style points, I can report it did yield a rigid square frame that was built in less than a half an afternoon's work. Now, while the frame build went quickly, it took considerably longer to get to the point where I had a rideable transporter. And one of the first issues to be addressed was the final drive. The motors as received here had nine tooth bicycle sprockets, while the scooter wheels were fitted with 90 tooth number 25 sprockets. After a number of hours of pouring through catalogs and gear versus speed calculations, I decided to refit the motors with 24 tooth number 25 sprockets. However, these off-the-shelf sprockets needed to first be rebored and countersunk before they could be attached to the motors. Given the drivetrain setup, the car needed chain guards. This slide attempts to show how I addressed this. But to explain further, what I did was take some 5mm Luon and band it with 1 inch aluminum, plus a lot of JB Weld. On the inside, I reinforced the join with 90 degree L brackets, and then on the outside, cloth straps were epoxied across the join. So far, even though the materials are dissimilar, the bond is holding and there's no sign of cracking. Earlier, I said a walking cane formed the tiller. To explain this further, have a look at these slides. What you're seeing is the cane turned upside down and the handle end has been extended by inserting a solid steel rod in it. This rod then passes through a bushing fashioned out of three-quarter inch copper water pipe that was bonded again with JB Weld to a steel conduit strap. The strap and bushing can be seen attached to the 8020 center strut. A similar bushing was fashioned for the front this time using three-quarter copper coupling in place of the pipe. And the whole assembly is locked in place with a pair of screw-type hose clamps so that the rod can't come out of the bushings. I should tell you, too, that the cane was unbent slightly at its handle end, so that the tiller rises from the deck of the car at an angle rather than coming straight up as it ordinarily would have had it not been modified. And finally, for this application, two custom-built pipe clamps were added and a piece of aluminum channel was used to tie these blocks together. This channel serves two purposes. First, it stiffens the cane through the bin, and second, it serves as a cable raceway for the electronics that lives above the deck and on the tiller. Here's an overall view of the electrics that live on the underside of the transporter. The lower bay hosts the car's fuse battery packs and a solid state 40 amp relay. On the center strut is the power ground distribution point and the upper bay contains most of the car's electronics which we'll take a closer look at in the next slide. So here's a closer look at the electronics located in the upper or forward bay. The mega clone straddles the tiller and to each side of it sit the SX7970 motor controllers. Then, just below the Mega, you can see the 6050 MPU, which is attached to the tiller bar. 
With this arrangement, the MPU can sense both the pitch and yaw of the transporter and at the same time pick up the roll action of the tiller, which is effectively the steering command. The MEGA has been fitted with a prototype daughter board or shield. This board serves as the primary landing site for most of the control signals and also serves as the logic power distribution center. It is also the host for the Radio Shack electronic buzzer as well as a few resistors and capacitors which are used to sum and filter the BTS current signals. There's two exceptions to this, however, and they are the serial links to the MPU and the topside Leonardo, which are tied directly to the Mega. With this layout, I can happily report that there has been no interference issues or processing lockups. The one downside to this is the buzzer with its 79 dBA output is really inadequate to be heard over the motor noise, which is mostly gear noise, which ordinarily would be a lot less if these motors had been fitted with helical teeth rather than the flat ones they actually have. So now let's take a quick walk around of the finished transporter. Probably not ready visible in this view, but located at the top of the tiller brace is a toggle switch which operates the 40 amp relay. Then just below that is a 24 to 5 volt converter with its LED display. Then you can see the four wire cable that carries the 5 volts power and serial signals to the Leonardo, which is fitted with a 1602 LCD display and keypad. It serves as the transporter's dashboard. Depending on what the car is doing, the display will show running or alarm conditions, and the keypad will allow the operator to select one of three operating modes. And now it's time to take it out for a test drive. So when I get the little red button, it's recording. Yeah, that's correct. It also has sound. All right, so it can hear you talking, <laughs> not me. Stop. 